Good day, Alex. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself to us? Oh, absolutely, Guy. Thank you so much. First of all, you know, I want to thank you for uh, this opportunity. I've seen some of the folks you, you have done these videos before with, and uh, I'm, I'm truly honored to be here. So, uh, yeah, let me introduce myself. My name is Alexander Salas. I, uh, I'm an instructional designer and learning developer by, by trade. Um, but uh, originally, as you know, <clears throat> just to uh, educate some folks here in the video, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I served in the, in the U.S. Navy, and I was what is called a hospital corpsman. Some people call that a medic, but don't do that in, to, <laughs> to real corpsmen because that, that would be fighting, fighting words there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so tell so, us a little bit about this. So where did you, uh, where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school, high school? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting, it's a mixed bag because I do have some, uh, a dual cultural uh, upbringing. I was born in Caracas, Venezuela, uh, back in 73. So that puts me at 46, uh, you know, I guess I'm... I'm a young chicken for a lot of people, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe not. But uh, yeah, I was born in Caracas, Venezuela, and I um, I grew up there until I was 14. So I actually went through the school system there, um, and then at 14, I came over here to the states uh, to Miami. And uh, that's because uh, half of my family, uh, well, my mother's side is Cuban, and and my my dad's side is Venezuelan. So I had those two cultures really growing up. Uh, when I was in Venezuela to begin with. And then, you know, when I moved here to the States, uh, I, pretty much when I moved here was 88, 89, and that was pretty much the height of uh, a lot of influence of Cuban culture, Miami, and, and uh, at that point there was a lot of immigration also from uh, Central America, mm -hmm. uh, Central American countries, Nicaragua and whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, I, um, I came here and then I started going to high school uh, here. And uh, that was, uh, it was an interesting uh, shift in paradigm and yeah, many, many lessons learned for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. So without delving into that too much, oh, so what, what took you to the United States Navy? So uh, yeah, interesting things. Uh, I, you know, originally when I was, when I ju decided to join the Navy, I was looking, it was a quest for education to begin with. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was... Uh, I always thought it was a cool idea when I was when I was here growing up, you know, as a teenager and whatnot, kind of like a thought. But it was a uh, it was really purely a lot of people, as you know, joined because of college education, right? They, there's the thought that you can get a college education <laughs> going to the military. Right. Well, there's different ways to go about that. But in any event, that was the primary uh, motivator uh, there, because at the time I was uh, I. I graduated college, I mean, I graduated high school, and uh, I was working two jobs. I was doing, you know, service jobs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, didn't have an education, and one of the main things I always, you know, my parents put in me was, like, get educated, get educated, get educated. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> at 24, I was looking at my life and going, okay, well, I'm having a lot of fun, and I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm having two jobs, and I work in the tour in the tourism industry. But um, you know, what's next? What's the future? What's what, what am I going to do with life and whatnot? So, I saw uh, I saw a, a commercial for the Marines, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> as you probably know, right? Not a lot of people do that, and <laughs> so I saw a commercial for the Marines, and I was like, hey, that's, that looks cool. <laughs> I'm going to do that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then my my mom almost had a heart attack <laughs> when I told her. So I, so then I went for the next best thing. I was like, oh, maybe it sounds cool. And then you know, uh, <laughs> funny story, a recruiter the recruiter was just working me out. <laughs> so they showed the movies of my mom of like Top Gun and stuff like that. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, once you once you're in the service, then you understand <laughs> why. Why they do those things? Yeah, <laughs> so. it was it was all a perjury trap. <laughs> um, yeah. So so it's interesting that you were a, a hospital corpsman in the navy, um, and how did you then get from there to um, instructional design? Talk talk to us a little bit about 
that transition what what oh yeah what caused that what that that's where it all began really i mean um so i for one thing i was a corpsman right but if you think about it uh you know i i joined the number one customer of instructional design in the world or instructional systems design, mm-hmm. you know, uh, kind of make a good distinction there between what, it, what we see today as instructional designers in the private world and, you know, the, the real thing, as I call it. But um, the instructional systems design, I went through that system and then uh, I already, I was a, I was a good student uh, growing up. You know, I was really, I was really good at recalling facts. I'm a, my recall was great. Studying was great. So, you know, in the military, you have to promote taking a test and also doing your performance uh, appraisal and whatnot. But mm-hmm. the test part is a lot of things that is, is something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, I didn't have an issue with, with that because I was a good student. So I had these techniques and things like that. So I started sort of uh, naturally mentoring folks. Uh, once I reached the level of E5 or what they call HM2 or sergeant level and many in many uh, other services, mm-hmm. I I had a responsibility. I was in a leadership role, and I had responsibility for for a team of ten or uh, a twelve uh, corpsmen in a clinical setting. So, at that point, uh, I took it upon myself to kind of say, "Hey, guys, you know, whoever wants to study for the promotion exam, I'll, I'll stay here after work on so and so days. You can all join or whatever." So the people that did. Uh, promoted, <laughs> you know, with at least they didn't have any issues with the promotions uh, because of the exam. They did, were in the exam. So that uh, kind of started the spark of things because it gave me that, you know, that thing that many trainers experience. And the reason why many trainers get in, con- continue to do what they do today is that a hard moment, the reward, you know, effect. I mean, we're all dopamine junkies, right? We mm-hmm. all like a little dopamine shot. And that was a dopamine I got from that, you know, that it, that knowledge that I'm helping people progress in their lives. So, um, start a little bit of spark there, uh, let's say physiologically. But um, in in service, I uh, I had to uh, coordinate some workshops for a uh, retired chief that was doing health education, and I also had to do health education classes for weight loss. And uh, I got to meet this uh, this instructor, and the, the instructor was a chief, and you know. And so again, looking for in my in my, you know, I was raised as a chess player, so I was uh, nine years old, um, seven years old. My dad taught me how to play chess, mm-hmm. and I didn't get it at first. I was like, "What the? This is boring. This is not a video game." Blah blah. Right. But then I started. I got into it. So always, I think that influenced my life because I was looking at the next three moves, right? Mm. And so when I looked at, at that point, I was like, well, what am I going to do next? What am I doing after this? The Navy, what's going on? And I liked that job. I looked at his job and I was like, man, that looks like a sweet job. You know, you just go around, give classes, get, mm. you know, help you learn. So that was the first thing. And then I was like, okay, how do I, how do I get into that? So I started... I ran into another chief that was doing, uh, uh, he was going to college, and I'm going, how are you going to college? We're here, like, you know, we're, we're deploying, stuff like that. Oh, no, we got this online school um, that caters to the military community. At the time, it was called Toro, uh, Toro International University, or something like that, or University International, backwards, so TUI. It was based out of Cypress, uh, uh, California, L.A. area. And um, and then it became I, I don't know I think like four years later after I graduated uh, it became Trident uh, University International. But uh, I started taking classes there classes there because we're all completely online and we're talking here back in 2006. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, crazy to think that now it's like 13 years ago, <laughs> you know. But uh, but yeah, so I started taking classes is completely online and. Um, and it was health education. So I figured, okay, this this chief was a health educator. I'm going to be a health, health educator. That's what I'm going to do. Because I'm in healthcare. It makes sense. Blah, 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 right? So I started, um, there was one class I took. It was called Adult Learning Theory. 
you know, and that class pretty much changed everything. <laughs> you know, at that point, I was like, oh, there's a dollar in there. Mm. And then I found out that this was an actual job. Like there were actually jobs out there where people were just training in a company, uh, like any civilian company. And I was like, oh, really? And then I found the ASTD, American Society for Training and Development. At the time, is now, you know, ATD, as you know, Association of Talent Development. And so uh, one of the main things for me out of, out of school, out of the education that I got in, in that bachelor's of health education, to me, it was always the value of research. So um, knowing where things came from, uh, what work has been done on it, and what has been documented, regardless of whether it happened two years ago or happened 20 years ago, all of that is valuable. So that, um, you know, so I apply that to everything and I started looking at the, the industry, this industry that, you know, I didn't know existed. And okay, I found, I, I used to go, I remember for jobs, I always used to go to the, uh, the Department of Labor's uh, Occupational Handbook. Uh, I used to find that online and just look that online. And interesting enough, you know, uh, many of the jobs that we do are not there. They are, they're just listed, I think, like training occupations or training or something, but nothing really specific. So, man, it was, uh, I decided then to go for the master's. Um, and it was in the same organization I was um, at the time. Uh, I think I would have changed some of those decisions, but I was already familiar with the school and in the format. So I didn't want to, you know, go brick and mortar and then stop from, uh, I still had to work and I, and I did get out of the Navy. Um, so that was, uh, but you know, uh, no, no regrets as my, uh, my, my son jokes about. <laughs> yeah. So, so I understand that uh, you uh, have uh, recently decided to start your own company. Can you tell us a little bit about that and when it's going to launch? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. So, um, so actually, it's been alive for four years, but it never has been, it's always been a, a, a dream part-time project. So now it's a, it's a full uh, living, earning occupation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, stylelearn.com, and it's uh, e-learning consulting uh, e-learning development design, instructional design consulting firm. Ideally, you know, to simplify it, it's very simple. It's to, I provide services to either make uh, content come alive that is learning content. Let's say if a company already knows, hey, this is a training program, this is how it is, how can we make it more interactive, online, engaging, and more effective, right? And then that's for existing content. There's also the possibility of partnering with businesses or business units, uh, holders, stakeholders and whatnot to then uh, apply, you know, the principles that we all will know and come out with some great solutions for the business problems. So that will be the full instructional design service. And then besides that, I do workshops um, because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a hybrid. I mean, in my career, I started as a trainer and uh, always loved the visual design pieces when I had to put together my decks. So I'm no shame to say that I was a, a PowerPoint assassin, as they call them. <laughs> um, yeah, I was a PowerPoint assassin at first, but I always had that flair where you looked at one of my slides and you pay attention, at least to one of them, because the visual metaphor thing, right? So um, from there, I was like, okay, this is great. I love talking. I love you know, engaging with folks one-on-one -on -one and whatnot. But again, the whole thing of, okay, what's next? I uh, kicked in the whole thing that I do all the time. And what are the next three moves? And I did see the value back in 2007 of e-learning, of, of the online format. Um, and, you know, if it's done correctly, I think it could really create more impact than, than what is usually perceived. So... I do workshops. I became a very good developer, very creative in Articulate Storyline and Articulate Rise and um, Adobe Captivate and things like that. So I also provide training for teams that perhaps, you know, need, need to have that specialized 
dedicated um, you know lessons on on the on the applications. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Let, let's, so that's your future coming up. Uh, congratulations on that. <laughs> Best wishes. Uh, let's go back a little bit now. Um, yeah. So the the title of my video series here is HPT videos. Now HPT is known by lots of other different names. Human performance technology is also known as human performance improvement or simply as performance improvement. Um, right. But it's all about evidence based practices. And so. Um, can you share with us uh, the moment that you came across this concept of evidence-based practices or research-based practices? Again, uh, we've got sloppy language in our field. Um, but uh, talk to us a little bit about, about uh, your roots in evidence-based practice. Oh, yes, yes. So, you know, I, I think uh, what helped a lot for my case is that I went and got educated before I started working in the field. Um, it wasn't the, the traditional thing where, I mean, I did have to do training in the Navy, but it wasn't really, you know, a, a full-time dedication to it. I was, because you were medical, you had to do, you know, medical intelligence briefings and things like that, educate the, uh, patients, right, on their treatments and, and that type of thing. So, uh, and from time to time do some classes, but really because of the advantage of being educated before I started doing things, I, everything was based on research. So I looked at, you know, the, understood the value of peer review research and, you know, and validating sources and all that good stuff. And then, you know, the different types of research that we can have and action research and all that. So primarily, you know, from my end, uh, I focus on a lot of the learning uh, theory and, and the application of that and and you know I say that in terms of that uh, instructional science two people really come to mind Gagne and um, Robert Gagne and um, and you know his followers like David Merrill um, because uh, when we're discussing instruction then there is a good amount of uh, experimental studies already and a good <coughs> amount of research already validating the best ways or the best results you can get, at least cognitively and and also behaviorally, based on their models and based on their um, their theories. But uh, you know, as you uh, as you also enlightened me in the past with, and and I I got to uh, read upon back in the day in the old magazines. You know, uh, Gary uh, Rumler, uh, the late uh, Mr. Rumler, which was amazing. Uh, all the work that he did and uh, the the books on white space uh, in the organization uh, really, really interests me in the sense of the systemic view of the sun. And, you know, going back to the Navy, right? Then I'm looking at the systemic approach of it. Um, you know, and, and, and when I went through boot camp and I went through the Navy, I understood, right? Like, like okay, how do we get, <clears throat> how do we... How do we get someone that's been living 18 years on their own thing, doing their own thing, you know, no no specific setup of discipline or standards? How do we get that person to transform in two months, you know, uh, and follow all our standards and procedures and, and whatnot and at least get them there so we can continue to, you know, uh, mold the personality? And I, and I do think that I do think that the military service, military service changes you. Um, in because of that experience, so yeah, um, from evidence evidence based practice, I mean, um, it's also a very fuzzy term, right? Uh, <laughs> we can get into because some people think of that as being something different, like, uh, well, I've seen this, so it must be true, <laughs> you know, or it's that's evidence, right? I mean, it's there, I'm looking at it. But, you know, I like the basis of being more research-based, um, looking at things. And then also, particularly lately, that my in, because of doing that, I've been finding so much uh, of interesting gaps, so many interesting gaps between academia and workplace learning and, and where all that should meet. You know, where is that perfect sweet spot, the balance that we should get into? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me ask you uh, uh, to describe in 30 seconds um, mm-hmm. what I'm asking for is an elevator speech. So if you were to give an elevator speech 
as an example for others, we'll take your elevator speech and, and adopt it or adapt it. But uh, so right. how, how do you explain to people what it is that you do? <laughs> well, what I do is I, in, depending on the services needed, what I'll say, let, let's focus on the real thing, on the on the full thing. What I do is to be able to partner with you, let's say if I'm, we're talking directly, I'll be able to partner with you to help you solve business problems. And that business problems, can, you know, they can be solved either by training or they can be solved by performance support measures. You know, things about looking at the system uh, from the street levels, you remember, you know, uh, Rumbler, uh, the organizational, the process, and the individual, right? So looking at those three, looking at those three levels, I, I like to partner with folks and kind of look at what is the problem they're trying to solve, and then determine what is the best route to do that. There are times that perhaps you will need training and performance support measures in that, but I don't, I don't think it's wise to think that one or the other uh, need to exist without the other, you know, type of thing. Um, in some cases. It is because you already have knowledge and skills, but in some cases it's not, right? So uh, that's primarily it is to the focus on solving the business problem. And we're not talking, you know, solving your whole organizational problems, but solving your business problem and the reason in determining whether training is the right solution or not. Then from there, I bring in a different approach of creativity through e-learning and through other uh, models that that's what I think is the differentiator. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, uh, a current focus as a lifelong learner? What What are you focused on learning? What's What's the next thing for you? So you know, uh, my my main focus has always been is an interesting mix of things, but I always been really interested in technology and learning technology, particularly uh, because I think that's how we actually get things done. You know, like you. Unfortunately, we don't have the strategy behind things in many a time, and we just go against the technology, right? And then, you know, you don't get it done. But I think the technology today is so much power and so much wonderful opportunities that we have, so many wonderful opportunities we have, and they're not being utilized. So I, I love looking at technology and how we can either create content uh, more effectively, easier, more engaging, uh, in those words, they all have different meanings and we have to be really careful as to exactly what we mean with that. But, but in most cases, you know, when we say engaging, we mean that actually people want to want to do something with it, you know. And if, if we say effective that, you know, we're achieving the specific metrics that you want to get to. So um, it's not just so much about creating training, uh, creating content, uh, getting on a content loop, but more about creating relevant, and I know you call it authentic, right? Mm -hmm. So relevant and authentic uh, learning experiences. You know, and when we say experiences, we mean the, what happens before, during, and after that specific event, right? So mm -hmm. not so much. I mean, I know that, you know, e-learning always gets a bad rap and it gets thrown into the whole course mail thing. And I don't think that it should be limited to those things. I mean, e-learning today can be targeted to a job task, can be targeted to specific things. It's just a matter of thinking outside of that compliance, you know, bubble mm -hmm. that we'd like to apply to things. So, Is there a favorite uh, term or phrase in the business that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you don't like how it's being used currently. Um, <laughs> what the... What, term or phrase would you like to focus on here? Right. You want me to go with what I got back on the board? <laughs> <laughs> I said earlier that that was very provocative. Like I, as I read it, it says Addy. But, uh, but uh, yeah. go, go ahead. So what, what, yeah. what term or phrase would you like to uh, define for our audience? Well, I, it's, uh, I, I like to go into Addy. Because Addy is, is first of all, the clear a few notions that Addy, you know, is not a model, although it could be. So the, the context is what makes a difference there. So I, as you know, I run a blog, and you've been part of the blog, and thank you for being on that, the uh, uh, off-the-cuff blog, where we get experts or different people learning and development, and we have spontaneous 
conversations, right? So one of those conversations is actually with Robert Branch, Dr. Robert Branch, um, who I I like to say I like to blame for <laughs> for the label of Addy. I think there was an article back in the day uh, in ASTD, back in the maybe 90s or so, where uh, he was doing a lot of research, Robert Branch was doing a lot of research with um, Gustafson, and uh, and they um, they made this uh, mention of you know well when you look at most instructional design models they all seem to do this and then you know they label analysis design development implementation evaluation great uh, now interesting thing is uh, you start looking at Addy and what I found interesting was the Sam book came out right uh, Michael Allen's uh, mm -hmm. Sam. So, uh, successive approximation model, which is actually the first term used by Skinner uh, for his uh, experiment on, on rats and <laughs> learning. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I just didn't like that Alan used the Sam, but that's another that's another conversation. But anyway, mm -hmm. so so um, in his book, actually, Alan points out uh, some of the research that was done about Addy and how it's like, okay, who, who, who made Addy? Who created Addy? Because nobody seems to claim it. And even, you know, uh, I think it was Florida State University that's getting credited with that and maybe came out of that. And there was an original, uh, original place where that came from. There was an original model where that came from. Uh, the inner service, procedural service, uh, model, something like that. You can look it up online. And I will give you something that was called uh, that was called a DIC. So A D D I C, control was the last stage, and had the evaluation pieces in there. Um, but I think it needs to. It's very important to understand that if you're trying to create an instructional solution, and a, a solution that is based on instructional science to do effective training uh, for, for any system, any learning system or any training system that you're going to put in place, that you understand what model you want to apply. Because then Addy is not a model in that sense. If I'm doing, if you say you're doing Addy and then on your analysis you're just saying, well, yes, I talk to people and I ask them what the problem is, uh, is different than saying, okay, I'm going to go and grab the training Navy man, the Navy training manual, or the Air Force training manual, who was the Air Force. I think back in the '90s was probably the last one that created an iterative type of model for Addy. And um, if you look at that now, you're looking at 27 different steps to look to look at things. So it's not just, and there's good uh, correlation. There are good relationship between HPT and and Addy in the, in that lens, in the ISD lens, because you have job task analysis, you have organizational, you know, the needs assessment, the gap, the performance gap assessments. You got all those assessments going to the analysis form. I mean, in reality, here's the thing, just to drop a short, because I know I can go along for this four hours, but to drop a short here is like, look, if you really think that you're doing Addy, there's a few things you should know. One is that your process on the analysis and design uh, phases or stages, or we want to call it, should be heavily documented. And it should be documenting all the things that you are considering that are affecting the outcome of what's going to happen. So if you're doing analysis, it cannot just be two or three things. There need to be some system variables in place. There need to be some environmental things. There need to be some job job tasks on point, and uh, and then for from that you should be able to then say, okay, this is we know the training is now solution is the solution, and because the training is a the solution, then this is what how we should apply apply it and do it like that. But uh, one of the things I've been hearing a lot lately, and you probably heard about, it, is agile. Right? Yeah, so, right. Oh, agile, agile, agile is this, agile is that. And so I'm a certified Scrum Master because now I feel that I can talk about it with a little bit of authority. <laughs> so, so agile is great. Agile is amazing. But it wasn't created for learning and development. It wasn't created for instructional science. So we just got to be really careful in what we're saying and running around with, uh, well, we're going to do agile. Well, if you, if you go do the research on agile, it wasn't created for any of that. It was created for products and services and ideally software. So 
doesn't mean that it can be applied, but will be applied. So the final message is Addy is not a model. There are like over 50 models out there of instructional design, and you should look them up and kind of get an idea of what works better for business. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I agree. I always, when people berate Addy, I ask them, which of the two million versions are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Or all exactly. of them? Oh, yeah, well, the fact that, you know, when they talk Agile, then they told you, oh, it's uh, linear. Oh, that is linear, so now. Right, right. Like, okay, well, different conversations. Uh, I appreciate you uh, bringing this, these topics to the fore so that people could debate them. Uh, because yeah. I think there's a lot of, you know, we grab shiny new technology. We also grab shiny new labels because they're different, and we've, you know, we're running away from the sins of the past to some future thing, and we're grabbing on to, we're not getting back to basics. We're going after, uh, I don't know, something that's maybe glitzy. Yeah. Uh, and it's popular in the executive suite. They're reading books about it up there. Yeah. Um, let me shift it here a little bit, and I wanted to ask you about people who you've worked with in your career. Um who you would like to acknowledge. So if you have a story you can tell about uh, you were with them at some point and you had this experience together. or um, But what I'm looking for is to try to uh, bring to light people from our past or present who are of influence and may, and may not get a lot of recognition. But anyway, so uh, who, who do you have stories to talk to us about? Oh, well, so, you know, uh, I got couple of stories but one very recent one and one very uh dear to my heart is actually um i had the opportunity because of the off the cuff log uh i started reaching out i started with the idea of reaching out to different people and for whatever reason i remember i had the book uh, principles of instruction uh you know and uh and i thought well david merrill where where is he is he alive? What's going on? Right. So I find out the guy's alive, and thank God. <laughs> and, uh, I reached out and uh, ended up being able to meet him. And not only did, did did I meet him, but it was a great thing because I was able to go to Utah and actually interview him live um, in his vacation home in Bear Lake uh, out there in uh, Utah. Beautiful place. Didn't even know about that place, so that was also another, another amazing experience. But you know, he doesn't often. I think he he gets a lot of the credit in um, in academia, mm -hmm. uh, AACT particularly. Uh, I know he always goes there, but um, it's one of those uh, you know amazing work that he's done. That if you are interested in instructional design, especially with a focus in e-learning. You have to have his books. You have to have his. You have to look at his work. Um, you know the twelve principles of instruction are, are amazing, and also the the uh, work that he did with the models that he created. You know Pebble in the Pond gives you once you know that training is what you need. It does give you a nice uh, uh, metaphor of you know the ripples, right? They come out from. Uh, being learner center and then looking at everything else, but uh, I, get, I think the greatest thing about his work is that, first of all, talking to him one on one was so influential and and so uh, rewarding for me. Uh, it's almost like if you know you like rock and you meet Elvis, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. But but um, um, it was the the fact that by looking at his work and talking to him, then I appreciated that he was so based on the importance, even though he was completely in academia the whole time, he was so based on the importance of application, you know, of the application of recently acquired knowledge and, and the act of learning uh, per se of that, right? So um, I know another thing, you know, you hear many things in the industry, but one of the things that we hear in the industry all the time is like, oh, what they're able to do, what they're able to do is say, well, you can't do much if you don't know anything. So. Right. You have to be not just based on that. I understand that people go from a great, great, I think they have good intentions when they say that, right? Able to do, yeah, don't focus on being trivia-based and knowledge-based just for, just for the sake of it. But you have to consider also that 
you know, the, there's more just than just saying being able to do. So I appreciated the fact that he gave us the, he left the body of work and he also created some great people, for, you know, he mentored some great people for research for like, for example, uh, Charles uh, Regoleth. Um, and that's another, that's another rock star to follow that he's done a bunch of good work in instructional design. So um, I think if we're able to do that, then we're able to really uh, do something that works and stays out of the fuzzy terms and the, and the marketing uh, stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you. Well, who was the second person? You said there was two. Oh, well, he's no longer with us, but um, I, you know, uh, part also of, of what happened this year with, with the blog is I got to talk to Lauren Anderson. Um, and Lauren Anderson wrote the revision, the Bloom's Taxonomy. Uh, taxonomy. The person who's no longer with us is, is Benjamin Bloom, of course. But um, I think, uh, you know, Benjamin Bloom has done some also very interesting stuff uh, with learning mastery and, and different things. And I think, it's, uh, I think it's important to understand what, where he was going on with that. And I liked also how... I love how I found out this year that you know there was such a misinterpretation. There's such a misinterpretation of ben, uh, Bloom's taxonomy when it comes to learning objectives. That um, you know it's uh, it's just baffling that it goes the in the business. It's almost like you, you know people are just you hear people regurgitate that stuff, and I don't blame anybody because I'm actually when I went through my master's program, I gotta say this. I I learned the same thing. It was like, oh no, yeah, it's uh, blue sex. We're using blue sex not to be like a menu at a Burger King or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so and it's not the way. That's not the way it was intended for. So, <laughs> uh, but as another conversation, I guess you can go check the episodes. They're, they're in the vlog. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will put a link there to them. How are you doing with? Uh, I I went and subscribed and. Uh, I'm I'm like in the low two hundreds, I think, and you're trying to get a thousand subscribers by uh, by what, what's your deadline here? Yeah, yeah, we I I um, I was interested in doing that. I was trying to get some. I've been playing around, experimenting a lot with social media and, and getting things going, and I realized that uh, you know uh, for what I'm starting to realize really uh, maybe it's just not a good uh, observation, but <laughs> maybe it's not valid all the way through, but. I sort of realized that uh, we're kind of like a small group of people, and <laughs> and and kind of it's almost like a good old group of nerds or geeks or something. Like we we got a little niche, and <laughs> there's not really like you know, it's not like you're gonna get a hundred hundred thousand subscribers, <laughs> in right? In your so Twitter true. feed, yeah. <laughs> so um, so you know, I changed the strategy a little bit of that, but the strategy in the beginning was sort of like uh, yeah, to get a thousand subscribers by the end of 2019. That didn't happen. I mean, I'm just using LinkedIn to kind of promote that. Um, and that was through, it's a chapter effort, it's an ATD chapter effort, right? right? The Central Florida. I think uh, just to also clarify, I'm, I do a lot of things. And one of the things I do is I'm president of the local chapter for uh, ATD, which is now the Association of Time of Environment, as I mentioned before. And um, so the blog is part of a, of a tactic of... Um, you know, extending and expanding the brand and also helping um, helping the world really with this knowledge because when you look at you when you go to YouTube, YouTube is a phenomenal place, phenomenal platform for learning things, but you also got to have to sift through a lot of um, you know not good content or not right. you know valid content. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, so that was the the whole point there. But no, we are two hundred and fifteen subscribers and really at this point I was going to take it down, and I was going to bring everything to the membership, to the membership. But now we're staying on there. Oh, good. Um, yeah, we're leaving it out there for the world because it's really about, it's about you know, helping folks out and and yeah, giving that resource. No, that's the that's the nature of many of of us who are in the field is wanting to help, and yeah, feeling rewarded from from helping people and capturing, um, uh, capturing on video is but one medium uh, to share with others uh people who 10 years from now getting in the business might want to look at some of these videos as we try to save salvage 
these uh, lessons from the past and yes. honor them and not force everybody to go through the same learning process to find out that something does or does not work. Right. Um, well, uh, any other? So my last question here is uh, um, one for the people who are new to the field here, just as we were talking about. And uh, what, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially for those who, again, are new to the field? related to all things performance improvement? Hmm. Yes. Um, so there are a few things. Uh, it's something actually very important to share. <laughs> I'm working on this project uh, because of many of the things that uh, I think I shared before that one of my interests lately and what I'm working on a lot is, is kind of provide opportunities to close the gap between academia and, and workplace learning. And it's because there's a gap, but the gap is not, you know, intentional. It's not like, you know, academia doesn't care, or whatever the case. It's just that there's two different two different lanes, I think, right? I mean, when you go to academia, you learn how to do research, and there's a research community for that, and there's opportunities to continue that career in academia, but it's not, not necessarily something you're going to be doing in, in private work, uh, especially as an instructional designer, let's say, or um, you know, individual contributor. So, I I'm developing a digital platform. Uh, it's called learning elearninglaunch.com. Um, you can go there now and kind of uh, submit your email so you can get notified when when it launches. I'm planning to launch it in February. And what it is is a uh, it's a digital community of learning that's going to have uh, courses by me and and hopefully I'm trying to get some other folks in there. But uh, they're going to be based on all the good stuff we're talking about. So maybe even in the future, I, I may course you into uh, <laughs> doing something for, for that community guy. But, uh, <laughs> but that's one thing that I'm doing because I've been mentoring so many people mm -hmm. on, that are in this situation, right, that um, want to go into the profession. They want to be in learning and development as a learning professional and do that. Now, of course, we know that many people end up there you know they end up being a learning professional uh meaning that you were doing a job and then somebody quit and you know right. the trainer quit and now they're like hey you're pretty good how about you do this right and then you are get thrown into it so my my um my advice is to uh for one thing um get educated now what i mean by that is doesn't necessarily mean go get a degree uh, obviously, there's a lot of this beautiful value in getting a degree, but I do understand that you're going to be going forty thousand dollars in debt, uh, whatever, whichever good school you go to. So, um, you can get educated many different ways. Today is just a, a plethora of information and, and opportunities. We got videos like this. We got so many other things, but obviously, in the HR world or in the HR community. It's going to matter that you have a degree or you have some kind of credential to back you up. So I myself, I'm a certified professional learning and performance, CPLP. You can also become a CPT. Is it CPT or CPTD? CPT. CPT, yeah, certified uh, performance, performance technology. technology. <laughs> right. So you can become that. There's different focuses there, right, whether you're systemic organizationally, whether you want to be in the instructional science pieces, all that. Just realize that there are many uh, different roles or targets to go into. So be specific about what you want to do. Um, align that to what you desire, right? So if you if you know that you're naturally talented in visual design and you like, you know, making things look easier, mm -hmm. then probably uh, e-learning or instructional design could be the thing. And that's where that platform that I mentioned comes into play. But if you want to be more on the, you know, you're great on soft skills and you're great on talking to people and finding out problems and how to solve them, then that's where the CPT and the CPLP help you out in the sense of learning all these theories so you can, you know, with an educated mindset, go and solve the actual problems that uh, are in business. So uh, from what perspective, that's what I will say that uh, I can provide to anybody um, you know, that is new and is no. uh, in there. Thank you for that. I think that's uh, uh, good advice 
to keep learning and get yourself more formally educated and understand uh, the science behind what it is that uh, you're doing. Alex, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do this uh, video interview here with me today. And uh, I hope, uh, I wish you uh, best luck in your business endeavors as you launch into that. Uh, and if everybody has a need, uh, you should contact Alex. We'll include his, uh, his website uh, in the, uh, in the uh, video that we're doing. Alex, again, thanks so much. Cheers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys.